Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Thomson Reuters Westlaw Edge and Answer One. Their virtual reception service is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to handle inbound calls, schedule appointments, and even respond to emails. Check them out at answerone.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. That's answer the number one dot com. And now on to the show. Welcome to the AVA Journal Legal Rebels podcast, where we talk to men and women who are remaking the legal profession, changing the way the law is practiced, and setting standards that will guide us into the future. Hello and welcome to another episode of the ABA Journal's Legal Rebels Trailblazers podcast. I'm Jason Taché, a legal affairs writer with the Journal. Today we continue to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Legal Rebels Award. For the past decade, Legal Rebels has put the spotlight on those that think outside the box and push the boundaries of the legal profession. This year on the podcast, we're catching up with some of those original Legal Rebels to get their perspective on where they've been and where they see the industry headed. Today, we have Jeff Carr. He was an inaugural legal rebel in 2009. At the time, he was the general counsel at oil and gas company FMC Technologies in Houston, Texas. He joined the company in 1993 and became general counsel in 2001. While there, he caught the ABA Journal's attention through his Alliance Counsel Engagement System, or ACES, which was a series of standards to get more from out-of-house counsel. Retiring in 2014, he jumped back into the swing of things when he became general counsel of chemical company Univar in 2017. He's also an avid race car driver. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us. Now, back in 2009, when you became a legal rebel, the journal wrote that you originally thought an in-house law department with no reliance on billable hours would be more efficient than a firm. But ultimately, you decided that was an incorrect theory. Why was that? Well, it's it's not so much that uh, no reliance on billable hours. It's that there needs to be a change in the calculus between the companies. Um, if you have, there's an old saying um, that if you buy service, if you pay for service by the hour, you buy you buy hours and not service. And and I still believe that very much. I think. Hours and time is a component of a provider's cost, but it's really not a component of price. Uh, price is really all about value, and um, my thinking has evolved a little bit. It's not changed a whole lot, but it's it's evolved a little bit. We now use a concept that we call delivered value, or DV, and um, DV equals E3, and the three E's are effectiveness, efficiency, and experience. Um, and let me unpack those a little bit for you. Effectiveness means did whatever the project was, um, did it achieve the objectives as, as they were laid out at the front end? Efficiency is um, did you complete the project on time and at or under budget? And then experience is is not what lawyers normally talk about experience. They talk about experience of, of their experience. Like, I was a Supreme Court clerk. I, I'm the best contracts person in the world. I've won 57,000 um, cases, whatever it may be. I'm not talking about that kind of experience at all. I'm talking about customer experience. Um, what was our experience as a customer with the service provider as a provider? Um, and so we uh, we always use a, um, a component of compensation at risk based upon those three factors. Uh, that's the basis of the ACES program as it was uh, originally designed back in the late 90s. And it's still, it's the same basis today. But uh, the factors have gotten honed down a little bit. So that's where my thinking is now, at least. So effectiveness and efficiency make sense to me as metrics, but experience seems a little bit more soft. What specifically are you looking at to know whether or not the experience was a positive one or not? Sure. Well, they, they are soft, but they are subject, like any kind of a measure, to metrics um, and, and measurement. And the factors that we work with are predictive capability, uh, responsiveness, and um, just frankly, just ease of work with. I mean, it's it's almost the, do I want to go out and have a beer with these folks after, after work? There's a component of that. Were you difficult to work with? Were you good to work with? Do you listen to me? Um, did you call me back? 
all of those kinds of things that in-house counsel normally complain about, about their outside counsel. We, we measure that and we evaluate it. And it's on a scale ranging from does not meet expectations to wildly exceeds expectations. And the, the middle ground where most people are most of the time is meets expectations. And so to dig into this, this system a little bit more, you already mentioned it and I mentioned it in the intro, the Alliance Council Engagement System or, or ACES. To give our listeners a little background was that this was a way that you decided to start vetting and operating with uh, law firms that your company at the time, FMC, worked with. Um, after a series of questionnaires and interviews, uh, and a firm was chosen or a series of firms were chosen, standards were set, including a definition of success uh, in the dispute at issue and a time-based budget targets. Uh, what I think is interesting uh, for many was probably that your partner firms could earn anywhere between 80 to 120 percent of its agreed to fees based on meeting or not meeting those standards. Tell me a little bit about that. And I, I got to assume, at least at the beginning, some of your or out-of-house counsel partners might have balked at the idea of doing the work and then getting 80 cents on the dollar. When you think about it, really kind of an amazing perspective. The legal industry is one of the only industries I know of where customers act like like uh, suppliers and suppliers act like customers. Um, I mean, if you're really customer-focused as a supplier, you recognize that value is what the customer determines it is. It's not what you think it, it is as, as a service provider. So, yeah, there were some companies, some um, legal service providers that weren't particularly interested in working with us this way. And um, look, I'm not out to change the legal world. I just am, am out to change the people that we work with. I'm not going to tell firms uh, how to manage their business, but I am going to tell them that if they want to work with us, that's the way that we do things. They're perfectly capable, willing, um, able to not work with us on that basis, but that means they're not going to work with us. Now, I'm not going to say that 100% of our work at FMC and FMC Technologies was done on the ACES basis, but towards the end of my tenure, probably by the middle of my tenure, pretty damn close to 100% was, um, and we're moving to exactly the same kind of thing here at Univar. Um, so yeah, there was some resistance, um, and that was kind of met with um, this look at my face not caring. Um, this is the way we work. If you wish to work with us, then that's the way things are going to be. But the ACEs model, and that sounds rather you know, draconian and offensive and like a two by four upside the head and whatnot. I don't mean to be disrespectful at, at all, but the ACEs model is based on the fundamental premise that the customer and the service mo service providers, the law firm's interests are divergent, especially in today's world where the billable hour is still prevalent, where lawyers are still uh, evaluated on realization rates, as the firm defined them, as associates still have billable hour targets in order to get bonuses or, or good evaluations. If you work in that world, the incentive is to increase production and production of hours. Um, it's not to in introduce efficiency. And so, you know, the a law firm's economic model is really, really very simple. It's um, the more hours I build, the more money I make. There isn't a customer in the world that actually wants that deal. What the customer wants is to buy um, as few hours as possible to get the results I want. So there's a point of convergence between us. Um, you know, it's that point where where those two curves, I'm, I'm willing to pay a certain dollar per hour rate for more hours than, than I mean, I'm sorry, for fewer hours than for more hours. So there's a point of conversion. The whole idea is to shift that to the left in, in an economic curve and then to split the sharings, the savings between the firm and the buyer. And so the, the ACEs model is really just, it's a way to align interests, but fundamentally it's a way to, to force the buyer, my side, to tell the law firms what our objectives are to tell the law firm what our service level expectations are, and then to give them meaningful feedback as to whether those things have been met. Far too often, the in-house world complains about our outside counsel, but we don't actually do anything about it. We don't actually tell the firms if they're doing well or not doing well. And that's just wrong. The ACES model is based on a communication, um, and it's based on setting those expectations, measuring those expectations, and rewarding the firms for performance. It's, it's hard for me to, frankly, accept a contrary view. How can we not 
be based when we're customer service providers? How can we not base our compensation on actually providing customer service? So that's the fundamental premise. The ACES model is is basically, it doesn't matter whether you bill hourly, fixed rate, or not. Um, It's basically, you bill us on whatever basis we've agreed. We pay 80%. We hold back 20. We give you a report card, um, either periodically or at the end of the engagement. And based upon that report card, you get either zero to 200% of the amount withheld. So that's where that 8120 calculation comes in. So one of the things I'm always interested in when people are trying out new models is what was influencing them at the time that they were creating the model. Looking back in time when you were beginning to put this together, who were you reading? Who were you talking to? Who was influencing your approach that ultimately became the ACES model? Well, there really wasn't. I mean, this was developed in the late 90s. There wasn't anybody out there. There were a limited number of people talking about fixed fees. There were very few people talking about alternative fees. Um, normally, the prevalent model, if you were, would would be a, a discount from whatever the, the normal billing rate would be. And, and that's not an alternative fee. That's a discount. But there were guys like Mark Chandler at Cisco, Tom Sager at DuPont, Craig Glidden at the time was at CPCM. Um, he's now the, the uh, general counsel of GM. Ron Barger um, and a, a handful of us that were thinking about, and this was back in the late 90s, early 2000 period, um, thinking about how, how do you do things differently. And, and, and all of us were experimenting with various things. Um, I was probably further out in using these kind of economic measures, um, the at-risk kind of measures uh, in the alter- what people call alternative fees. But they really didn't start taking hold until about 2008 as part of the ACC value challenge, um, where, where the dialogue really started. Um, I mean, there have been talk, like the ABA hosted a conference in the early 2000s about the billable hour, um, and that conference was then reheld back in the late 80s or late 2000s, I think. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff written about the billable hour and its demise and alternatives, but most of that literature is post-2005. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of writing about this back when we first developed it in 1998, if I remember correctly. And then we subsequently followed that by running the first reverse auction on the internet um, the next year and and that, and that rolled it out. I mean, nobody else had done that at, at that point. So I want to pivot a little bit and ask you about something you do outside of the office. Uh, a couple of years ago, the journal did a profile on a half dozen uh, attorneys who are also race car drivers, and you you happen to be one of them. Uh, and it never crossed my mind until preparing for this interview that race car driving could be a hobby someone has. <laughs> How and when did you get involved with race car driving? Well, it, it goes back a long, long time. When I was very, very young, my family was involved in the um, in the auto repair business and ran an auto body shop in um, Lower Delaware. And I worked in the shop from about the age of 10 on. And um, in my late teens, um, I did some auto crossing in sports cars and things like that. Then it's then I didn't do that anymore. I mean, you know, law school and life and kids and all those kinds of things happen. And I didn't drive. Always loved cars. Cars, always liked fast cars, but but didn't competitively race. And then maybe about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, I went to a corporate event, and uh, one of the activities was a um, uh, an afternoon at a Bob Bondurant um, um, school, and uh, we did some autocrossing and, and whatnot. And then, then shortly after that, I went to a Jaguar event that was kind of the same thing. And I found that I liked it, and I still wanted to do it, and I was okay at it. <laughs> Uh, and so then I, I started looking at, well, what kind of racing do I want to do? I always like sports cars, always liked open wheel, bought an open wheel car and um, started racing what they call vintage um, racing. Um, then I did some sports car racing. And at one point while I was retired, I actually owned nine race cars at one point. It's it's an illness. It really is an illness in a lot of ways. Um, but it's exciting. But it's it's also a funny hobby in the sense of it's an expensive hobby. Um, it does cost a lot of money to do this kind of stuff. But there, it's a surprisingly 
parallel activity to being a lawyer. And I know most people would think that's crazy when I say that. But lawyer, fighter pilot, race car driver, we're all the same person. Um, We tend to be solo performers. Um, We tend to like a little bit of risk. We tend to like technology, but also like instinct, a little bit of danger, all of those kinds of things. Well, if you do that in a in a race car or a fighter pl- fighter plane, you either wreck or die or both. You have to rely on your team. You have to rely on um, a very rigorous set of protocols in order to perform well. And as I started thinking about it, I thought there were tremendous parallels between being a race car driver and being a, um, a, a lawyer. It, to do lawyering really, really well, you have to engage in what I call the, a perfect execution model, uh, which actually comes from a group of fighter, fighter pilots called the afterburners. And that's, it's, I call it P3, which everything you do is you plan, you perform, and then you perfect. So you have to know exactly what you're going to do when you do it before you engage in the activity. Part of that plan is also then checking all of the infrastructure and all of the tools to make sure they're safe. And then you go out and you you perform the activity and you perform to the plan. When the activity is done, you sit down and you debrief or you perfect. You look at what did you do well, what could you have done better, what went wrong, what went right. You look at the data to make sure you improve performance the next time. So it's this sort of holistic, continuous improvement process that applies as much to law as it does to, to driving a race car. We'll be right back with more from Jeff Carr after a message from our sponsors. This is the ABA Journal's Legal Rebels Trailblazers podcast. The Insights from the Edge podcast series brings you the latest legal trends as inside attorneys sit down with industry experts. Stay informed on the latest topics, including our latest episode on five ways to identify the best AI. Check out this episode on the legal current from Thomson Reuters to learn how to evaluate AI solutions to ensure you have the best tools for your legal research. Is your firm experiencing missed calls, empty voicemail boxes, and potential clients you'll never hear from again? Enter Answer One Virtual Receptionist. They're more than just an answering service. Answer One's available 24 seven. They can even schedule appointments, respond to emails, integrate with Clio, and much more. Answer One helps make sure your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800 Answer One or visit them at answerone.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. That's answer the number one.com. And we're back. So, Jeff. After you retired in 2014, you gave an interview to the journal and you also started giving talks uh, about uh, the issues you saw still affecting uh, the practice of law. At the time, you told the journal, quote, when I was a law firm associate in the 70s, I immediately realized that there was a disconnect between the interests of the firm and the customer. And we've talked about that a little bit today. But at the same time, you gave a talk at Georgetown Law Center where you said, The real crisis in access to justice is the cost of legal services has simply become too expensive for most individuals as well as small and mid-sized companies. There simply had to be a better way to deliver value to customers, and the industry needs to reform and restructure itself or it risks irrelevance. So what I'm curious about is over the last decade, there's been this growing trend, as you noted earlier, of more pressure on out-of-house counsel uh, to be more efficient, but as well as the growth of in-house departments. I'm wondering if you're willing to take a look back for us, how far do you think the industry has come in both, it seems like you have two issues here, both uh, reforming service delivery and the business model itself. How far do you think the industry has come in reforming those two areas since you were an associate in the 70s? I think there's been a lot of progress, not as much as I'd like, but more than I probably like to acknowledge sometimes. the It's very different today than it was in, in the 70s. Um, it's more competitive. The providers are more cost-effective, more focused on delivering a value. But still today, the basic model remains a model of brute force lawyering and its application of hours by people to do things. So I kind of go back to 
a few, and, and fundamentally firms are still in what I call an old law model. And there, there are four waves of models of service providers. There's old law. Old law is not in the business of solving legal problems. They're in the business of billing hours to solve legal problems. There's what some people call new law which also is not in the business of solving legal problems. They're in the business of billing lower cost hours to solve legal problems. It's what I call elevated law. actually is in the business of solving legal problems effectively and efficiently. And then there's what I call next law. Next law is in the business of preventing legal problems from ever arising in the first place. Those are the four waves. And I think we we are in the mix now between old, new, and elevated not to next yet. There, there is still a very large contingent of law land that is in the old law model, still billing hours. There's an increasing number of new law firms, and, and these are firms that are billing lower cost hours. And so it's a labor arbitrage model. It's both law firms and what some people call alternative legal service providers or law companies. Basically, that's taking out brick and mortar, having reduced cost people, and then fewer partners to share share the, the wealth. But it's still basically a billable hour model, just lower cost billable hours. Elevated law is is where we're starting to look at how the work is done and introducing efficiency um, into the into the model as opposed to simply labor arbitrage. I remember a long time ago when I first became general counsel of FMC Technologies talking to one of the leaders in the alternative legal service provider uh, business at that time. Um, and they were pitching the model to me. And I said, you know, and basically it was, you want to, I'm sure you want to reduce costs, Jeff, don't you? And I said, of course I do. But what I'm interested in is how are you reducing the number of hours as opposed to the cost of the hours? And they didn't have an answer for that um, because that wasn't their business model. And it still isn't for most of Lawland. Most of Lawland still is a cost plus model based upon the cost of the hours being delivered. So we're making progress, but we're not making as much progress as we need to make. There are a lot of reasons for that, and most of the reasons for it, frankly, are on the customer side. The customers are not demanding as much change as they should be. Why is that? Because most of the customers are lawyers. Um, you know, we come from the same tribe, so we're used to working the same way. We we think in terms of, of hours. It's really hard to get lawyers to think about not doing stuff as opposed to doing stuff. So we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot of progress to, to be made. And um, I think the old law model, there will be pockets that will continue to exist for a long, long time where price is insensitive, but we will increasingly move to the elevated model. And then my hope is that we move soon to the next law model where the focus is on prevention of legal problems as opposed to the optimized handling of legal problems. So, you know, a lot of work to do still. I I like that paradigm between old, new, elevated, and next. I'm curious uh, to who you're watching in the elevated and next law categories. Are there particular people, companies, uh, even I, I could see government agencies that are beginning to implement or, or think about these things in a way that you think could have long-term impact on the legal profession? Sure. You know, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on now, um, especially in what I call that elevated law space. You've got Axiom and United Lex and uh, Riverview, uh, which is now part of E&Y, which that in and of itself is very, very interesting. You've got the accounting firms um, outside the U.S. taking, you know, becoming significant legal service providers. All of those players are talking more and more about how the work is done as opposed to who does the work. There's not much focus today on next law. Ron Friedman, um, one of the writers, um, he coined a, a hashtag called do less law. And I think that's kind of cool. I mean, I think that's a really good idea. Kind of the way I've thought about it is as an in-house lawyer at the front end, the sort of old law model, we were doing more with more. So we were doing more work using more resources. We're challenged in the new law model to do more with less. In the elevated model, we're challenged to do less with less, less law, less resources. 
in the next law model, where, I, where I'm trying to drive people to go is to do less law with more impact. And, and so that's adopting a prevention mindset, trying to address the demand side of um, the legal services model as opposed to um, the supply side. Even if you, you've embraced the elevated law concept fully and you've optimized absolutely everything you do, at that point, you've got no place to go. The only place you can go is reducing demand. And when you look at the demands on the, on the typical in-house department, demand comes from three buckets. Um, it comes from disputes and enforcement. It comes from IP and deals. And it comes from the normal day-to-day operation of the company. Why do I put it in those three buckets? Because they're convenient for me. The first bucket, disputes and enforcement, is all about the past. It's clean. It's following the elephant and cleaning up the mess that the elephant made. IP and deals, all about the future. Most IP doesn't actually provide value, and most deals are value destructive. The general stuff, the, the normal operation of the company, that's the stuff just keeping the wheels on, keeping the lights on, contracts, HR, corporate and um, affiliate administration, that kind of stuff. So of those three buckets, I can optimize my processes in all three of them. But if I really want to step change delivery of value to my company, I want to reduce demand. I can't really reduce demand in the general administrative bucket, but I can reduce demand in disputes and enforcement by having my company behave better, better processes, better contracting, better safety, better quality, all of those kinds of things, understanding requirements and delivering. And on IP and deals, I can help my company by um, understanding in our company what makes for a successful acquisition and only doing those kinds of acquisitions. For IP, focusing on what actually will deliver value as opposed to what's shiny and new and interesting. And so those are the doing less law with more impact, and that reduces cost further and helps the reputation of the company, helps shareholder standing, truly delivers shareholder value. So that's kind of what I'm focused on these days, and that's what I find interesting. But there aren't very many people that are actually, when when you talk with them about it, they understand it, they sort of embrace it, but they don't, it's challenging to do it. Plus, there's a problem in our culture, and not just the legal culture, but the culture generally, of hero worship. You know, we love firefighters. Don't really like that guy that tells us we should put in more fire extinguishers and fire alarms. So, you know, we have this hero worship. Unless I have a crisis, I can't be a hero. And lawyers are fundamentally heroes. Um, So, you know, what I'm projecting here goes to the core of our own self-value as a tribe and as a culture. How do we live with that? How do we reconcile our role in society if there are no, no, no more fires to put out? But nobody wants a fire. So, you know, it's, um, it seems to me like it's the right thing to do. It's just kind of hard to get people to get on board. So you've talked a lot about changing business process, this idea of hero worship, uh, service delivery, uh, and kind of rethinking the whole nature of kind of how the practice of law has worked for you know, what has been this century so far and most of the 20th. I'm curious that if, how you think if we were to have you back in another 10 years and whatever the podcasting version is of 2029, do you think we're going to still be having these same conversations or do you, are you more optimistic than that? Do you think we will have, have moved on? What a great question, Jason. I mean, it, it, frankly, that's why I came back to work. I mean, I was retired. I was sitting on a beach and racing cars. And I, I came back to work here at Univar not to be a general counsel again. I mean, I'd done that for 15 years or 14 years. Um, it was because I had the opportunity with Univar to take these concepts and ideas and see if they were scalable, see if they were repeatable, see if we could actually do what it took f- 15 years at FMC to do. Could I do it in three or four? So that was the challenge. I think 10 years from now, the market will look very different. I think there will be more of a focus on the elevated law um, silo, if you will, or segment, the delivery of value through um, efficiency um, as opposed to by brute force. And then I think there, I hope there may be some nascent beginnings of this next law philosophy, the prevention philosophy, but I don't think we're quite there yet. You know, it's kind of like, in some ways, it's, it's like a safety culture. The objective of any safety culture should be zero injuries. The objective of any 
quality culture should be zero defects. The objective of any legal team should be zero legal problems. And if you adopt that as a mindset, destination zero, I call it, if you adopt a destination zero mindset, everything you do is designed to take you closer to that, even though you know you, you and you accept that you never can actually get there. I mean, you know, I'd love a world without litigation, um, without disputes. You can't get there. That's not possible. But you can do everything humanly and systemically possible to reduce the incidence of disputes um, as, as opposed to focusing on the optimal management of them. So, you know, I think in 10 years we'll still see change, but I, I think there'll still be pockets of old law that will exist and prosper. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's room in law land for um, lots of different models, but I do think there's going to be a big squeeze on the traditional delivery model. And I think the traditional delivery model's days are truly numbered. But, you know, heck, I've been produce, I've been predicting that for 20 years. So, you know, I've been wrong for 20 years. I might be wrong for another 20. Well, it's definitely a, a ripe opportunity for us to have you back uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Legal Rebels uh, and see how those prognostications played out. Jeff, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Jeff Carr is the general counsel for Univar and one of the ABA Journal's first Legal Rebels. I'm Jason Taché, and this is the Legal Rebels Trailblazers podcast. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalRebels.com, LegalTalkNetwork.com, subscribe via iTunes and RSS, find both the ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, or download the free apps from ABA Journal and Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.